Thank you for watching this next presentation uh, that is geared towards restoration project managers and technicians. If you have not yet downloaded the quiz and worksheet for this presentation, pause now and go to our blog at microscopicminute.com. Today's presentation is on passing post remediation verification on the first try. PRV or post remediation verification is when you have a consultant or a third party come in to assess your work. If you yourself are assessing your own work, that's called post remediation evaluation or PRE. Technically, you should always be doing PRE. Usually, PRV is done in situations where the work may have been complicated, the client may be sensitive, there might be legal issues involved, or the project may be uh, subject to different occupants coming in, like at, a, like at a commercial space. All right, if you don't know who we are, we're Environmental Initiatives. We're an indoor environmental testing company. So we are hired to come in to assess buildings for water damage, asbestos, moisture, odors, air quality. We figure out what's going on and what needs to be done. Much of our sampling is analyzed on site using microscopes or other devices so we can usually tell people in real time what's going on and what needs to be completed to address the situation. Myself, I've been doing this since 2003, so about 17 years at the time of this recording. My background is in microbiology and immunology, so I study people and how people interact with contaminants. This presentation is going to cover what we as a company, as a consulting firm, do during our post-remediation verification. What kind of steps are we taking? Then we're going to be talking about the final walkthrough that your project manager should be doing on each job, uh, what types of items should be assessed. Then we're going to talk throughout the presentation on the common causes for failing the PRV. And we'll also be talking throughout on some good habits, things to do to make sure you don't fail. For questions and answers, you can put questions down at the, in the comments section, or you can call or email me with my contact information that's provided at the end. All right, post-remediation verification, what is it that we are looking for? All right, the big overall picture of proper remediation is clean. Clean all the materials that are staying in the, in the containment, remove the materials that can be removed, and thoroughly clean the space of the loose moldy debris. Dry. Make sure your surfaces and materials are dry. Make sure your air is dry. And number three, don't cross-contaminate other areas of the facility or building while you're doing your work. All right, to be more specific about our remediation goals. Number one, we have to prevent cross-contamination. That's the first thing you're going to think about. You're going to either install containment or not, and you're going to either install critical barriers or not. Critical barriers are like plastic or tape over ductwork vents and over other smaller areas that can let air in and out of your workspace. Then you're going to be removing the moldy materials. What wall finishes and floor finishes and other materials that need to be removed if they can't adequately be cleaned. Then you're going to clean what's left, right? Wall framing, subfloor, uh, materials that simply stayed in the space. You're going to be cleaning usually with detergent solutions, nylon brushes. Uh, then you're going to clean the space in general. So after you clean your individual pieces, you're going to clean the dust from surfaces. And then usually after that, you operate your fans and your air scrubbers to remove loose moldy debris from the air. Follow all that, following all that work, you're going to dry the space, or during your work, you're going to dry the space. Okay, so you're done with all the cleaning and the drying, and you pat yourself on the back, and you feel pretty good about your work. So now the consultant comes in to do the post-remediation verification. So what am I going to be doing, uh, and what do we want to make sure it goes well? First off, I'm going to be looking at your containment. Did your containment uh, fall? Uh, is it adequately sealed? Did you contain all the areas that you should have? Now, if your containment fell or you left the zippers open, it is not an automatic fail. I, the whole point is that if your space was adequately clean and there wasn't any moldy debris releasing after that containment fell, big deal. But you know what? It doesn't look good if a, if a, if a uh, customer sees containment that has fallen, they freak out. 
Um, so we first check the containment. Then we walk into the space and we look around to make sure you went far enough. You removed the drywall two feet up. Well, let me look at the back of the drywall. Let me test it. Did you need to go three feet up? We check the per So we check the perimeter of the effort that you did to make sure you went far enough. Then we use a moisture meter. We use a moisture meter on the framing, the subfloor, the gypsum board. You know, did you adequately dry the materials? And we document that. After that, we then use a hygrometer to check the air. Is the air adequately dry? Is it adequately dry maybe in comparison to the outdoors or to other spaces? Then we physically look at the surfaces and we say, look, did you clean the surfaces adequately? You know, the wall framing, uh, the tables, whatever. And we take samples directly off of the surfaces that you should have cleaned to see if they are adequately clean of mold. We're not expecting all the mold to be gone. We're expecting a certain level uh, left, at least. And then was the dust in the air adequately cleaned? So did you adequately clean surfaces of loose dust that can blow into the air? And is the amount of particles, specifically mold particles, floating around uh, satisfactorily low? Again, we're not looking for zeros. We don't expect you to get every piece of mold out of there. But we have concentrations, both in the dust and in the air, that we um, shoot for or that we want you below. And then did cross-contamination work? We're going to take samples from outside the workspace to make sure you didn't spread stuff into other areas. Now, sometimes we were not hired to do a, a, a pre-remediation assessment. Sometimes the contractor comes in and just does their work. And what they don't know or don't realize was that there was already too much moldy debris outside their workspace. So sometimes we get in there and we do our testing and we say, well, you know, you, you remediated the bathroom, but did you know the living room also has too much moldy debris in it? I can't tell you if you cross-contaminated it or not, but I can tell you it still needs to be cleaned whether you, you um, do a change order and charge more for that to continue cleaning or you just do it. That's up to your company. All right, so here's some items with containment that uh, we, we observe once in a while. First off, we fairly frequently observe containment that has partially fallen. Specifically, the containment will often fall from ceilings, especially where the zippered doors are because people are pulling on them. So please always use zip poles. You can see the zip poles on either end of this picture. Uh, use zip poles or suspension poles, and also really consider if you should add a few staples to the tape that's taping your containment up. So if the client is okay, you should add a staple here and there to help keep that tape in place. It's pretty frequent that we come in and the containment doors are open, they're unzippered. Now, I know this is not always your fault. Sometimes this is because the client is coming into the contained space. But you know what? You should have a big sign next to that zipper door that says, always keep closed. And there's other times where a person will take their negative air machine. They'll take it out, but then they'll leave the opening open. So make sure anytime you make an opening or you create an opening in your containment, you instantly close it uh, as soon as it's made. All right, did the work go far enough? If I'm going into this bathroom, I'm going to say, okay, well, I'm going to remove this plastic and I'm going to look up the wall. I want to make sure that, uh, you know, you guys took the gypsum board, the drywall up high enough. And then you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to scan the floor because you guys didn't take the, t the floor tile up. But what if, what if the water release caused a decent amount of water trapped under the tile? Then what I'm also going to do, that wall paneling on the left side of the picture, I'm going to scan that. I'm going to pull that back a little bit. I want to make sure that that wall paneling on the left side of the picture also didn't need removal. So what I've just done is I've looked at what you've done, and now I'm going further in every direction to make sure that additional work didn't need to be uh, completed. After we assess your containment, we're going to then determine if the space is adequately dry. 
So obviously I'm going to use a moisture meter and I'm going to measure uh, the, the, the wall framing, the floors, the wall, you know, things like that. I'm also going to use a hygrometer to make sure the space is adequately dry. The question is, what are the, what, how much moisture is too much? Using a pin probe moisture meter, we want all the wood framing, subfloor, and other wood materials to be less than 16% moisture content. For gypsum board or drywall, we want the surface or the material to be less than 1% moisture content in gypsum scale. Now most moisture meters don't have gypsum scale, they just have wood scale. In wood scale, that's somewhere between 17 and 18% moist. For concrete, the level of moisture that we're looking for does vary based on the project. And for air, the amount of humidity in the air also varies. Often in the winter, we'll want less than 50% relative humidity. For summer, we'll want less than 70% relative humidity, typically. And basements, we typically want less than 50% all year. And the reason is that the basement always has cool surfaces that can condense moisture, so we need it to be drier. Uh, sometimes, however, we just simply compare the level of humidity inside to uh, outdoors or other, other areas of that building. And sometimes we focus not on the relative humidity, but on the grains per pound or absolute humidity, which are measurements of the total amount of moisture. Relative humidity, that measurement changes based on temperature. So if it's really cold or really hot, we can't rely on relative humidity as a temperature or as a measurement and have to do grains per pound or absolute. All right, is it adequately clean? Uh, there's a lot of areas that get messed. When you are walking around your space, you, you're probably looking at the floor and you're probably looking at the easy to, easy to uh, access surfaces. But you have to, when you're doing your walkthrough, you have to look at all surfaces, top sides of ductwork, top sides of foundation walls. Those areas are often missed and there's too much uh, debris and thus moldy debris above those spaces. So essentially, get as high as you can in that room, look down, and figure out if you hit all the horizontal surfaces as you should have. Now, did you adequately clean the surfaces of the mold? Now, in a basement like this, we will first do a physical assessment. You know, does it look clean or not? Then what we'll do is take a lot of surface samples. For example, we'll take three or more surface samples of the exterior wall framing, the stuff that's on the foundation wall. Then we'll take three or more samples from the interior wall framing. Three or more samples from wood paneling. Three or more samples from hard to reach spots like under the stairs. Three or more samples from floor joists, subfloor. Uh, three or more samples from horizontal surfaces where dust lands it, on surfaces that are harder to clean, like near the ceiling. And then three or more samples from easy to clean horizontal surfaces to see what's in the dust on those surfaces. So in a space like this basement, we're already taking 20 or more surface samples. And usually in a basement or on a level of a, a residence, it's one or two air samples. Now, we don't expect every single sample to be beautiful. We don't, and we're cool with that. We're looking for the overall amount of mold and effort and whether that was adequate. And like I said, we'll take air samples of general areas and then like you can see the microscope there on the right hand side, we'll analyze all of our samples right away. Sometimes we come into a space and the uh, coatings are already on. I used to care a lot about this. I actually care a little bit less now, but if I come in and everything is already coated, I'm looking for two things. Number one, did you paint over mold instead of clean the surfaces? For example, here's pictures of, of mold colonies where you can, actually, you can obviously see that they're white because somebody painted right over it. Uh, perhaps the mold somewhat grew after the work was done. If I see this, I'm going to make you re-clean the areas where I know there's colonies and then after I'm done looking at it, you're going to then paint it. There's many situations where a person will go through and they won't adequately clean or more specifically, they won't adequately dry. There are situations where you'll go through and you'll coat everything over wet wood and then you see here the green mold colonies. 
That's mold that grew on the wood, under the paint, it grew and it knocked the paint off. Here's another situation where the, wa where the wood was really wet, knocking the paint off. And here's the crazy thing, this could have looked beautiful four days ago. We come in to do our testing and we tell the contractor what happened and they don't believe us until they go out to see it. So you have to make sure everything is adequately dried before you put your coating on. So what we do to figure out if there was cross-contamination is number one, we're looking at the surfaces outside of containment for construction debris. Uh, number two, we're taking samples from the dust on surfaces outside of containment and we're taking samples from the air. If we think that there's other sources of mold we, because of the sample results, we'll then look to find those additional sources. And the final walkthrough. The final walkthrough is what your project manager is going to do before they say the job is good and ready for us to come in to do testing. What needs to be done during this final walkthrough? You should consider having a checklist, by the way, uh, just to fill out and put in your paperwork to make sure everything was looked at. So first off, is there any construction debris outside of containment? Do you need to clean outside of containment before we come? Uh, is a containment, are all edges of the containment secured and will they stay secured until we're there later that day or the next day? Did you go far enough? Check all the drywall, check the floors. Do you need to remove more, more material or not? Are the materials dry? Use a, uh, use a moisture meter, use your hygrometer, check to see that drying is complete. Uh, visual, visually look at the materials. Do they look clean? Did they miss areas of the wall framing uh, of visible areas of mold? And are all the surfaces adequately clean of loose debris and dust? Use a very bright flashlight, look around, look on top of surfaces, uh, be critical of yourself and your team. This process should take typically at least 15 minutes in, in most spaces like a basement or a first floor and you really need to use a bright flashlight to do this properly. Excellent, I hope you have completed the worksheet during the presentation. There's also discussion questions at the bottom for you and your team to talk about. Again, if you have any questions, please see my email or my phone number and join us for the next presentation on topics relating to the restoration world.